I'm Ian Stewart, Emeritus Professor of Mathematics at Warwick University, and I'm chairing Curious Maths, the event that is going on this evening. And uh, we have the other two panellists here with me. Um, I'm June Barrow Green. I'm a senior lecturer in the history of mathematics at the Open University. And I'm Marcus de Sotoy. I'm a professor of mathematics at the University of Oxford and also the um, Simone Professor for the Public Understanding of Science. Um, you're kicking off the event. So. Well, I'm going to start by um, telling you uh, about uh, a particular problem, which is the three-body problem. And uh, something I've done rather a lot of research on, in fact, the history of the three-body problem. Um, and uh, so I'm going to start by explaining what the problem is and uh, then explaining uh, how it's been tackled through history, um, starting from uh, Isaac Newton um, and bringing us up uh, to the space age. Now after that, Marcus is going to chip in. Yes, I'm going to talk about one of our great unsolved problems, um, the Riemann hypothesis. Um, I think that most people think that mathematics is kind of been finished, that Fermat's last theorem was the last theorem, we've finished it all now, and, and surely there's nothing else to discover about numbers. Um, but I'm going to explain that actually some of the most basic numbers in mathematics, the prime numbers, um, still hold um, an immense amount of mystery uh, and, and really are our greatest unsolved problem, is uh, trying to understand some sort of pattern in prime numbers or whether there's no pattern at all. And then Marcus just mentioned what I'm going to talk about, which is Fermat's last theorem. It was his last theorem, but it's not the last one ever. At least I hope not. <laughs> Since we're out of a job. <laughs> I'm trying to prove one myself at the moment. Uh, yeah, so this is a very famous problem. Um, many people have seen the wonderful television series program about it, um, where for 350 years nobody could prove or disprove Fermat's claim, which was that if you take two cubes or two fourth powers or two fifth powers and add them together, you can never get another power of the same kind. So two cubes can't add up to a cube and so on. And eventually this was solved by Andrew Wiles, a British mathematician um, working in the States, and he had a childhood dream of solving this thing. And then when he grew up he discovered that it was much too difficult and his PhD supervisor said to him, there's really no point working on this, Andrew. So he went off and worked on some other area of mathematics, which, as it happened, turned out to be exactly the area you needed to understand to prove Fermat's last theorem. But nobody realised this at the time, so it's a wonderful story. One of the things we have to think about is when actually do you have a solution? Um, and it's not always clear. And that's something that will come up with what I, I'm going to be talking about, um, because the three-body problem um, has many solutions. Um, but uh, are there solutions that we can use? Are they solutions that we can understand? I think that this is, is certainly going to be a theme that we'll be uh, addressing in, the, in uh, our discussions. Yeah, I think another theme is um, what's it all for? Um, uh, I think most mathematicians, we do it because uh, we're just curious. Um, I mean, that's partly why it's called curious I maths. Th I think so. I mean, certainly with Fermat's last theorem, in fact, Nobody really cares whether the answer is yes or no. What we care about, or cared about, is we didn't know which. And you feel very embarrassed as a mathematician when you've got this apparently simple problem, and you just don't know what the answer is. Um, now, what's actually important about that turns out to be the methods used to solve it rather than the result. But now, Marcus, with the Riemann hypothesis, actually people... Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of... Uh, yeah. uh, I, I think we study primes because they're so fundamental, but now, actually, primes are at the heart of uh, the cryptography that protects credit cards going across the internet. So um, a piece of curious mathematics has actually turned into an incredibly I important um, technological advance. It, it's basically what uh, all our codes are based on in our modern era, so it couldn't be more important than that. There must, by the very nature of the limits of the human brain, be problems that will be beyond our ability to conceive of a proof. Um, what always surprises me <laughs> is that time and again, somehow, these kind of finite little things here actually do manage to find a way through and answer questions about Fermat's last theorem or three-body problem. But yeah, there's a, there, I think sometimes people feel like maybe the Riemann hypothesis is just beyond... Um, our ability to, but, but I don't believe that. I, I, I think there's enough um, uh, kind of going on that we sort of have a sniff already of how 
um, the proof should go. So I, I, I do think it will fall. I mean, it's always difficult in this game. I, I, I wouldn't have known, I wouldn't have predicted Fermat to go when it did, I don't think, and, until there was this connection with elliptic curves. So um, I think it'd be very, I think I, I, the book I wrote about the Riemann hypothesis, and I talked to a lot of people who are at the cutting edge, they said we're still one big idea away from a proof. Yeah, I mean, there seems to be this interconnected series of things um, and lots of different problems like the Riemann hypothesis related to it. And if you could solve any one of those, then everything else would fall into place. Yes. And each one of them seems to even have hidden structure that hints at the others, but nobody can grab hold of... No, it's a bit like it a carpet. They keep yeah. on tugging it here. Oh, no, we pr oh, no it's popped up there. <laughs> oh, let's, we'll prove it here. Uh, and, and it's well, just sort of, um, yeah. yeah. But um, you do think there's something under the carpet. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. Well, and of course, I, the, I mean, the other uh, angle on, on this too is, is actually the, um, uh, the techniques or, or the things that you have that enable you to prove things. So I think you know, the classic, of course, in, uh, in this case, is um, the four colour theorem. Because you know that was the first really big mathematical problem that was solved using a computer, um, and that of course caused a lot of discussion in the uh, mathematical community and things. But now, um, you know, proof by computer, if you like, is is an accepted sort of form, you know, a way for mathematicians to go forward. But mathematicians fifty years ago wouldn't have have thought about that possibly maybe being a way of doing that particular problem. So what? The future holds in terms of, of technology and how that can help um, mathematics. I know that, for example, you know some mathematicians really believe that it's not going to be too long before, essentially, most uh, you know proofs by computer are, are going to be dominating mathematics. I mean that's that's a very extreme position, but it's one some mathematicians hold. What's happening is that as some of the mathematicians have been structuring the proofs so that a computer can check them, they've actually found new ways of proving things. And the proofs have become more transparent even to the human beings, not just to the computers. So we are gaining some creativity for the humans as well. But I think that's, um, uh, that word creativity is the real crux here because I think uh, you know, computers are still way behind what this computer can do as far as those creative leaps that are really it's the, important. It's the, ideas. Uh, the imagination just yeah, mm -hmm. making those leaps into the dark. I think that th this one's still the best. <laughs>